All right. Okay, well, so welcome to the class. And hi, Mac, and everybody. I'm very, very glad to, to see you. And today we are going to have a lesson on Kepler and Newton and the motion of the planets. So, do you remember uh, at the beginning of the class when we talk about the uh, Ptolemaic model and the Copernican model of the, the solar system, the uh, geocentric model and the heliocentric model? Anybody remembers that? What that was about? Okay, if you want to explain, Debra, okay, or, or Nicola, what do you remember from, from that class? What is the geocentric model of, of the universe? What was it? And where did that come from? Wasn't it... Um the two theories. The one was the theory of Earth, everything rotated around the Earth, and the other one was everything rotates around the Sun. All the planets rotate around the Sun, not all the planets rotate around the Earth. Or is it the, um, yep. the universe revolves around the Earth? So, originally, that is that is all. All the statements are correct, actually. So, originally. Uh, people thought that the universe was basically uh, the Earth at the center of the whole universe, and then everything else was rotating around the Earth. That is the geocentric uh, model, okay? And that was the model that was proposed by the ancient peoples and Aristotle, the philosopher, was uh, the main proponent and a backer of that model, and then Ptolemy, uh, Ptolemy, okay, I think that that is how it's spelled, okay, uh, no, I think that that is wrong, that is not the right spelling, but Ptolemy, <laughs> he basically um, derived the mathematics for explaining the, the geocentric model of the universe and they thought that really that was the whole universe that the stars were basically moving around the earth and all the planets were moving around the earth and the sun and everything move around the earth and then uh, Copernicus because okay Nicholas Copernicus he came up with the proposal that that wasn't correct, that the Sun was at the center of the universe, and that was called the heliocentric model. All right. And uh, still they thought that that was the whole universe. You know, they didn't have any other notion that, that there were other things out there. So. They thought that the sun was at the center of the universe, the planets move around the sun, and the stars were kind of a, a cloud of, of stars that also move around, you know, uh, around this, this universe centered on the, on the sun, okay? And in Copernicus' model, the movement of the planets around the sun was in, in a circle, okay, in a circular mo motion. Okay, so that was in the heliocentric model, it was in a circular motion. And yes, yeah, they, they thought that kind of the, 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 that it was, it was like, like fireflies. Um, have you ever heard of Laniakia? No? I have not. <laughs> I have not heard of Laniakia. And that is Anika. Okay. So if you want to, to explain what it is or put your mic up and, and we can talk about that. But um, so along this time, okay, 
Johannes Kepler was a, really he was a mathematician. He was an astronomer, an astrologer. He really liked to, to, to study about these things and he was teaching in a different parts here of the, the Holy Roman Empire. So Johannes uh, Kepler lived, was born in 1571 and he died in 1630 and he lived around these towns, the ones that are in red, okay? So if you can see, this is, uh, you know, part of Austria nowadays, okay? And part of Germany and part of France, all right? Or southern Germany. And so these are the areas where Kepler lived and taught and did all his discoveries, okay? Someone has the mic on. And there's a lot of background noise, so I'm going to mute them, okay? But if you want to say something, you are welcome to, to unmute yourself. So one of the things that Johannes Kepler did was that he was a deeply religious man. He believed that God had created the, um, the, the universe following some celestial order, okay? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, he lived in all those places. Let me see if I can go back to, up, uh, to the map. All right, so he would, he would have sometimes, most of the times he lived here in the city of Graz and he taught at a university, but sometimes his, uh, you know, work and, and, and things that he needed to do uh, had him move, all right, and so he had to move from one place to, to another, okay? Um, so, like I was saying, Johannes Kepler <coughs> believed that God had created the universe following a, a lot of order, a set order of things. And so, he thought that the dimensions of the universe were governed by the regular polygons, okay, the Euclidean regular polygons that had been discovered, okay. And so, he thought that the orbit of Saturn, all right, so if this is the planet Saturn right here, so he thought, let me get the pen, so kind of to mark the part, so if this is the planet Saturn, then he thought that there, the, 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 the planet was going around in a circle uh, that was uh, subs subscribing a cube, okay? And then we would have the planet Jupiter going also around a circle or a sphere that was subscribing a triangle, all right? And then Mars would be subscribing a dodecahedron and a icohasidron, <laughs> okay? And so all the planets were, we cannot see it in this picture very well, but all the planets were moving in basically smaller spheres and the distance between these spheres were regulated by these polygons, okay? The idea was totally wrong, okay? And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, correct, but it was a way for Kepler to find and try to express the order that he saw that God had in creating the universe, okay? In one of the things that he did was he traveled uh, here to Netherlands and he visited with a friend of his, uh, another astronomer, Tycho Brahe, all right, and this guy had an observatory. He was rich, and he had actually an observatory, and he had one of the earliest telescopes, and so he was able to record the movement of the planets very, very well. And when Kepler compared his ideas of how the planets move to the data, the information that uh, his friend had, he found that his model didn't match, okay? 
So I wanted also to show this. I, I should have probably put this slide first, okay? But this slide kind of is a, is a little bit of a timeline and it shows us all the things that happen around this same time, okay? So here we have the time of Kepler, all right? So we have here is Kepler's life. So from the mid 1500s to the mid 1600s, okay, the early 1600s. So the late 1500s to the, to the early 1600s, okay? Here we have Copernicus who came up with the idea of the heliocentric model. All right, so the heliocentric model was probably, you know, published that idea around here. And Kepler was born just, you know, 20, 30 years after that. Okay, so here we have Tycho Brahe. So that is the other astronomer that I was talking about. And Galileo Galilei. Remember that we talk about Galileo and some of the discoveries that he did together with Copernicus. So what, what were some of the things that Galileo discovered? What do you remember from that class, some of the things that Galileo discovered? Oh, okay. Excellent. Yes. So Annika is shared with us that we are part of a cluster, okay, the Laniakia uh, cluster of galaxies. Okay, so this is a suprastructure even, even bigger than, than, the, um, than the solar system. I'm going to look at that afterwards. Okay, so Yes, so Galileo, this, uh, one of the things that he did was he perfected the telescope and actually he used the telescope, okay, at the beginning of the 1600s, all right, in order to make um, observations of the, of the heavens, okay, and so he was able to, to record the things that he observed uh, this way. So another thing, okay, here we have the, the William Shakespeare, okay, is also around this time. So a lot of things happening during this time. See this event, Jamestown was established in 1607. So that was when the, 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 the first colony here in America, the telescope invented the King James Version of the Bible in 1611. The pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock in 1620. All right. And Isaac Newton, who we are going to talk about uh, later today in the class, uh, born in 1642. So 10, 12 years after Kepler. All right. We have uh, Newton. So Newton, he said that he was basically, his discoveries, his accomplishments were because he was standing on the shoulder, on the shoulders of giants. And he was certainly referring to Copernicus, to Brahe, to Galileo, to Kepler, you know, all the other discoverers, okay, all the other people that were able to, to discover these things that made it possible for him to discover his uh, discoveries, especially the laws of gravitation and, and so on. So I want you, to, the, the, the reason why I wanted you to show this is to see that this is the kind of the, some of the events that pre preceded the restoration of the gospel. So as people were turning back to God and trying to uh, find more about God, God was also starting to reveal more of the things necessary for the restoration of the gospel, okay? Even though the restoration happened hundreds of years afterwards, but these were all events leading to that, preparing for that. So, Kepler is best known not for this model of the solar system, 
that was kind of, you know, an adaptation of the Copernican model, but it was actually wrong. And he abandoned this model himself when he saw that the data didn't match the model. What he discovered was that the data showed that the planets didn't move in a circular motion. The planets move in ellipses. And also, he discovered that the Sun was not really at the center of this elliptical orbit, but it was at one of the foci, 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 of the foci okay? that's the plural for focus, okay? of uh, this elliptical orbit. Okay? All right, so that was the, f the first contribution of the, the, the first law of Kepler was to describe more accurately the orbit of the planets around the Sun. All right, so it's interesting because when you actually kind of look at them, the, the, look at the orbits, they look kind of circular, but they are not totally circular. All right, and so uh, many, many times the pictures that we see are kind of exaggerated, but um, they are still, they have some eccentricity, okay? So that was the first law that um, Kepler discovered. The second law of planetary motion is this, all right? Let me see if I can read it and describe it. It says, a line joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. Okay, so let me grab the pen. So the idea is the following. If we have this is the orbit of the planet, and an elliptical orbit, the sun is at in one of the focus of these ellipses. In the other focus, there's nothing. All right, there's just space. All right. And so the second law, it says that if you draw a line from the, 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 the focus, from the sun, to the planet, okay, and then you measure an amount of time, so let's say one month, okay, a certain amount of time, the planet is going to cover, okay, part of the orbit in that amount of time. And this other, you know, this other vector here is going to basically cover an area. All the green part is an area. If you do the same thing at some other time of the year, where the, the planet is somewhere else in the orbit, and you measure the same amount of time as before, okay, the same amount of time, now, this area, the blue area, is going to be equal in size, okay? Equal in size. So, now they don't look equal, but if you were to measure them, they will be equal. So, what happens is, this distance here, the distance from P3 to P4, is smaller than the distance from P1 to P2, isn't it? So that means, um, but the time is the same, okay? So we said that the time is the same for the two distances. So that means that the, the speed from P1 to P2 is faster than the speed of the planet from P3 to P4, okay? And even if it were further along, you know, further uh, out from the sun, let me try to do this a little better, okay, there, all right? So, and we call this P, okay, let me see. I'm not very good, of course, at this, okay, with the mouse. All right, so this would be P5, okay. All right, and this one P6, all right. Okay, 
suppose that this area here were the same as this one, now we can really see that this distance is a lot smaller. So the planet goes faster when it is f closer to the Sun. And then as it moves away from the Sun, in the farther part of the elliptical orbit, it is slows down. Okay, so the planet moves, and then when it goes, it gets faster, uh, closer, it would accelerate and be going faster this way. Okay, so that is one of the things that this second law was able to discover, is that the planets not only move in an elliptical order, but they also change in speed. Mm -hmm. What planet we are talking about? It would be any planet. Okay, so this, this is an interesting thing. This is a very good question, because these laws that Kepler discovered, they apply for, to any planet, okay, moving around the Sun, they also apply to any satellite moving around a planet. So they also apply to the Moon and the Earth. Okay, so the Moon also moves in an elliptical orbit around the Earth, and the Moon also changes speed depending on where it is in this part of the elliptical or orbit. Okay, now again, I have to warn you, they, they look very much like a circle, all right? But they, 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 because this, the focus, the foci, are very close together, really. And so when you, when you put this closer together, the ellipsis really looks more and more like a circle, okay? But they do move this way, and, and there are small changes in the, in the speed. All right, let's see what is. I see that in the moon, that it moves closer during the summer, all right? Well, so it's not just during the summer, all right? So the, the move Earth system kind of uh, um, wobbles one with another, okay? So the moon exercises some gravitational attraction on the Earth, and that is what causes the tides, all right? and also the movement of the Earth towards the Moon. And, of course, the, the, the Moon does also get closer. Uh, but this happens, actually, for the Moon and the Earth, it happens every 27 days, all right? Because that is the period, okay? The period of the Moon is about 27 days. So, Every 27 days, you have that the moon is going to be, you know, in the, in the uh, uh, apogee, okay? It's called the farthest distance from the Earth, and then it's going to be in the perigee at halfway through, closest to, to the Earth. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that's correct. So, uh, Haley says, so if there was only one focus, it would be a circle. That's correct. So, a circle is actually a special case of an ellipsis where the foci are so, are close together and they are in the same point. All right, so there's no eccentricity. Mm -hmm. This doesn't play anything with the seasons. Okay, so that is an interesting question. Very good question, Deborah. Some people think that that is the case, that if the, the Earth were closer to the Sun, it would be hotter, it would be summer. But, uh, and if it were farther, it would be winter. But that is not the case, because what is it that causes the seasons of, of the, on the Earth? Is it the elliptical orbit, or is it something else? Is the tilt, exactly. Yeah, so remember that the tilt of the Earth, okay, you know, so the, oh my goodness, that was really bad. So <laughs> the tilt of the Earth eh, causes that the Sun falls perpendicular on one side, okay, all right, and so you have longer days here on the southern 
uh, side of the equator and here on this, on this time of the year when the Earth is here the Sun would fall uh, more on the northern side of the equator and so you would have summer here in the north, winter in the south Okay, when the Earth is in this side of the orbit it would be summer in the southern hemisphere and winter in the northern hemisphere so because there is nothing in between the Earth and the Sun, there's basically space is empty, there's really nothing that uh, uh, changes the, the influence of the rays of the Sun along this, this small change in distance, really. So it is not a, not a, a whole lot of, of distance, all right? So yeah, the, so the seasons are not because of the elliptical order orbit or because of the change of speed along the orbit. The seasons are because of the tilt of the Earth. Okay. So now we are going to look at the third law of, um, of planetary motion. Okay, let's see what was this other... Uh, it is always winter and summer on the Earth. It is just cool. That's right. So there's always one, one hemisphere that is winter and the other is summer. Okay, so it couldn't be that it's because of, of the, the orbit. Mm -hmm. All right, so the third law of planetary motion. This is a little bit more complicated, but let me try to explain this one. Okay, this one says that the square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Ah, help! What does this mean? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's uh, look at things one thing at a time, okay? So, what is the orbital period of the planet? What is the orbital period of the planet? Okay, this is, by the way, is wrong. Okay, this is this is not really the the equation. Okay, it's a uh, so. Let's see, four years. No, what is the orbital period of let's say of the Earth? Okay, so the orbital period of the Earth is the amount of time that it takes for the Earth to go around the Sun one orbit. Okay, so yeah, so it's how long it takes to get around the Sun. All right, so we, we say basically one time, yeah, how long it takes to go one time around the Sun. So it takes one year. Okay, by definition, the period of the Earth is one year. Okay, only one year, all right? We would normally measure this in seconds, okay, or some other uh, measurement, okay, because here one is uh, just unity, you know. All right, yes? No, no, to, to go around, a good question, so, to go around, the Earth takes um, it takes 365 days, okay, and a quarter, 0.25, okay. Yeah. So, so what happens is that uh, because of this quarter of a day, every four years you have an extra day, okay. And so in order for the calendar to kind of catch up, that is why um, you, 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 you have the leap year, all right? Okay, so, <coughs> so it's actually a quarter of a day, not 23 hours. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a little bit, a little bit more, okay? So that is why every four years we have one extra day in order to keep the calendar synchronized. All right, so let's say, so th that is the period of, 
of the of the earth and so we say that one year square okay so one square that is going to be equal to one all right so one year square okay and that is saying that this proportional okay proportional so when we have a proportion we have a fraction all right and it says that this law it says that the the period the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi major axis of its orbit so the major axis is the longest axis here of the ellipsis okay and the semi major axis is basically this divided by 2 all right so that is this distance is the semi major axis this is called this distance it would be the semi minor axis okay semi minor axis the the, the shortest you know distance from of the from the center of the ellipsis all right to 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 the orbit so he's saying that this distance the semi major axis and this would be you know measuring in, in something okay normally the distance of the earth to the sun we measure that in astronomical units okay so we talk about astronomical units in one of our lessons and it's by definition the distance of uh, the, the the sun to the earth all right so if we have that that would be the the average distance of the sun to the earth is the semi major axis and so one astronomical unit so it's saying that the cube of that of this astron one astronomical unit is proportional to uh, to 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 the period okay all right so the cube of that okay would be that now of course that when we have one year and one astronomical unit that is not very interesting so it would be actually better if we transfer this into seconds let's say for the period and this into kilometers or, or miles okay for the for the distance but what happened is that the other planets also follow this um, this law okay and the scientists before they were able to see to to measure the periods of the planets okay because they could observe that on the let me go to this application this is a cool application that i have it's called solar walk all right can you see that correctly okay and so in this application we can see the position of the planets in the solar system we can go in and out and everything do lots of cool things okay but so people here on the earth were able to measure how long it took for the planet to do one period so for example we have here mercury so mercury is right pretty much at the line of the sun so and this is on today's date so we cannot see mercury uh, now because of of that problem because it's obscured by the sun but see how long does it take for mercury to go around okay so if we go forward in time so this is october 15 all right and as we go we see let's keep going okay so right about here we were back to where we were and so now we are on january 29 all right so here we can calculate how long does mercury take to go around the the sun can you see that the orbits all right they look very much circular but they are not exactly circular like for example here you can tell that mercury is closer to the sun in this part of the orbit and then farther 
from the Sun in this part of the of the orbit so you can see it really oops I click the, the wrong thing let me see if I can go back to to the position that I was before okay okay let's see if we can travel this and move this back all right so here we are okay so here we can see that again the earth all right is also in an elliptical orbit and apparently it seems that around here in this part in this area is closer than in this area okay of the orbit so the cool thing is that by knowing these proportions the proportions of the third law and measuring being able to measure the period of the planets Kepler was also being was able to measure the distance between the Sun and the planet the semi-major axis the same thing with Venus and so on relative to the distance of the Earth okay so let me see if I can move this I don't know why it keeps moving okay so I think that is because I click on on that that planet all right all right so that is the, the, the usefulness of this third law of planetary motion is that it allowed the astronomers now to figure out um, how, you know, by, by measuring the period of the planet, they were able also to derive how close or how far they were from the sun, okay? And this was the first time that they were able to do that. So by doing so, they were able to figure out, for example, that Mercury, okay, is just a 0 0.4, about 0 0.4 uh, times the distance of the Sun, from the Sun and, and Mercury, that it, than it would be from the Sun and the Earth, okay. And also that Venus, all right, Venus is approximately, you know, 0. Point, uh, 0. Point, uh, I think that is 8, okay, or something like that, 0. 0.7, okay, 0. 0.7 uh, astronomical units, all right. And this was a, a, an application, really, of the third law of planetary motion. And with this, they were able to figure out the the distance of Mars and the Sun, of Jupiter and the Sun, and Saturn and the Sun. Those were all the planets that they were able to see at this at this time. Deborah, you ask a very very good question. You ask um, how did they measure the distance? Well, so at this time, at the time of Kepler, they were not able to measure the distance, okay? So they, they were able just to, to, to measure the proportion of the distance, okay, from, from one planet to the other. But there was another story, we are going to look at that, I'm going to put it in next class. It's a fabulous story about how they actually were able to measure the distance, okay, from the Sun to the Earth and then the other planets from there, okay? So very, very good question, but you can see that all these discoveries, little by little, they, what, what they are doing is they are making the model, the picture of how the solar system works much better, okay? Someone was asking me if I can zoom out, all right? Yes, I can, I can zoom out, okay? So here we have the, you know, the other planets, okay? Pluto and the, the Oort Belt, all right, and even we can see, okay, the solar system now keep track of the sun there, keep going out, and so here we see the cluster, the vicinity of the galaxy, 
All right. Oh, this is this is the galaxy here. Okay. So that is that is our Milky Way galaxy in here. Let me bring this back in there and see if we can. All right. So that would be the Milky Way galaxy. Okay. I think that that is as far as this program goes. <laughs> All right, but yeah, very, very cool, really. Now we are going to zoom back in. We see the stars that are around us. All right, the sun is disproportionately bright here in this animation because, you know, it's just to help us see, see how the sun, where the sun is, but it's not really that, that bright at all when it's so far away. Okay, so here we have again... You know, so oh, I click on Mars, I guess. So we are visiting Mars again. But let's let's go a little further back up and see Neptune. Uh, I need to zoom out a little bit more. Okay, all right. So here we have the inner solar system where we where we are at. Okay. So, so you can see here, this is the plane of the elliptic, okay? When the, when the planets are, when we are seeing the planets just on the same plane, and most of the planets follow the same orbital plane, okay? And that is what is called the sun of the, sorry, the ecliptic, all right? Okay, so if we go, we can look at them this way, and then let me move it little bit further out here okay all right okay so now we are in a different position here let's see can you look at satellites yes actually this is this is actually very interesting this program is very interesting let me uh, zoom in here on on earth okay so let's see if we can bring Earth here and oh, oh, I went I went farther. Okay, so if we go actually and we zoom in on the Earth here, this program actually has all the satellites that are going around. Okay, the gray line is the Moon. So if we go a little further out. We can see the orbit and the moon itself. All right, so there's the, the moon. All right, and like I mentioned before, the moon also follows a, an elliptical orbit. It looks very, very much circular, but it does follow an elliptical orbit. The blue line is the, the orbit of, of the Earth, okay? So let's see, let's zoom back in and see some of the satellites in here. Come on, don't be shy. Mm. All right. Okay, and it's cool because you can actually even click on one of the satellites and it's going to show you the satellite itself, the name of the satellite and, and what it does and everything, how high it is in orbit and so on. Very, very cool program. Okay, so it's called Lunar Walk. All right, so here is Aqua, and it tells you all about what the satellite is and, and, and all the stuff. Okay, so very, very nice program for exploration of the, of the solar system. Yeah, mm hmm. Um, most of the planets revolve around the same plane, okay? Um, I believe that Uranus has a little, the most tilted of the, um, of the, the, the orbits, and Pluto has a very, very much tilted orbit. So Pluto is the, the one that is uh, the most tilted of all the, 
of all the, the planets in the orbit. But all the other planets, okay, follow the, the same uh, plane. They, are, they go around the same plane of the ecli ecliptic, all right? Why? The reason why has to do with uh, the gravitational force and the process of time. So what happens is that at the beginning of the solar system, when the solar system was first, uh, you know, made by Heavenly Father, okay, there were lots of things moving around in the solar system, you know. There were lots of things and they were moving in all sorts of directions and everything. But as things kept moving, what happened with those things? They either started moving around in an orbit around the sun or they started falling towards the sun or falling and colliding with each other. Okay, so more like a, a pinball machine, you know, so, but in this case, when you have that, the, 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 you know, comets and debris and dust and everything was uh, going all over the place, as they were colliding with each other, they were getting together, it's uh, the process of accretion, okay, okay, the process of accretion where the planets started growing, all right, and so uh, things eventually they either fell into the sun by gravity because they didn't have enough energy to stay in orbit, or they were they collided with each other, okay, and as you can see, over time there's nothing in the orbits of the planets because things have already either collided and become clear by, by this, uh, this process. And the same thing happened with things that were in different planes, all right? So it was, a, a, things started, you know, basically getting together, coalescing together. A remnant of that is here the asteroid belt. So the asteroid belt is basically a bunch of things, you know, rocks and comets, meteorites and so on that have not collided with each other. So they are all moving pretty much together. It's kind of like if you were thinking, you know, of a a circular freeway at rush hour, but all these things are moving pretty much at the same speed, so they are not colliding with each other. If they were moving at different speeds and in different periods, then they would collide and they would have been, you know, clean up or absorbed into, into other things. So that is why we don't have uh, other things. Mm -hmm. Does the sun rotate? Yes, the sun rotates, and that is what we saw that in, in the previous class. It takes about 22 Earth days for the sun to rotate. This is a very cool animation of the sun, and you can see the sunspots, all right, and the flares of the sun, and the sun's corona, the bright part around it. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Question, don't the planets sometimes perfectly align? The answer is pretty much no, <laughs> okay? Because, again, because of the third law of planetary motion, you have that all the planets are moving at different speeds, all right? So let's go a little bit further out again to see the, the orbits of, of the planets. All right, and so we were seeing, okay, let me go further in to see the inner, the inner planets, and we'll, we'll move the timeline, okay, along. So because you see that the, the planets follow this law, they don't move at the same speed. So it's very, very rare the time when the planets align. So here we are seeing Earth, Venus, and Mars, and we have been seeing them for several years already. 
and they never align, okay? So imagine if three, for three planets to align, it will take a long, long probability. Uh, for eight or nine planets to align is a, you know, almost impossible thing to happen, okay? So whenever you see pictures of the solar system with all the planets aligned and so on, know that that is really not real, that that is completely, completely fake. Okay, so we are in the year 2043. Okay, wow, we, we went um, fast, all right. Yeah, this program costs two bucks at the App Store. That's why I got it. I really thought, you know, that you would love to see it. And I'm loving it too, okay? <laughs> Don't take me wrong. I love it. <laughs> it's called Solar Walk, okay? And there's a similar application for, for, uh, for the iPhone, all right? So, yeah, <laughs> all right. So the interesting thing is, remember, the Deborah's question was why all the planets are in the same plane. That is also the same reason why all the planets, pretty much, they all move in the same direction. Because things that were moving in other, in other directions, in other orbits, were basically uh, swallowed up. Okay, they were cleaned up either by the sun or by other planets. Okay, so that is really how, how things uh, work in, in, in this uh, solar system. Very, very beautiful thing. All right, so let's put this back into, into motion. All right. Very cool animation, okay? But it's, it's all following the, 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 the scale. You see also here the asteroid belt moving, like I was saying, it moves also at the same speed, and that is why things rarely collide with each other. And the speed of the planets depends, okay, on the distance that they are from the sun. So the farther they are out from the sun, the slower they move. The closer they are to the sun, the faster their period is. As you can see, Venus rotates a lot faster than the Earth, the Earth a lot faster than Mars, and so on, okay? And that is all following the third law of planetary motion. So very, very important discoveries, okay? <clears throat> yeah, very important discoveries here, okay, that Kepler did to explain really the, how the planets move. All right, let's see. So question, okay. Which planet takes the longest amount of time to make one complete revolution around the sun? Which planet would take the longest to complete one revolution around the sun? Nathan says Jupiter, Deborah says Uranus, any other? Takers, we have two votes. Which one takes longer to go around the sun? Okay, another vote for Uranus. We have four votes for Uranus. Why? Alexander, is, you, you vote for Jupiter. It is Uranus, by the way, but why is it Uranus? So type now in the chat, why do you think that is Uranus? Mm -hmm. Uranus rotates backwards. Uh, 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 the Venus also rotates backwards. So Uranus doesn't rotate backwards. The axis is so tilted that it rotates kind of like if it were a, a, a ball. Okay. Yes, excellent. Good, good answers, everyone, because it's the farthest away. It's the farthest away from the sun. So following the third law of planetary motion, we have that the farthest the planet is from the sun, 
the slower is going to be because the period and the semi-major axis are proportional to each other. They are directly proportional to each other. So the, the, the way to know which one takes the longest is just to see which one is farthest from the sun. Okay, so good, good things. All right. So I think that now we understand the first, the second, and the third law of uh, motion, of planetary motion. Isaac Newton, I think that my time is almost uh, done. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I love the planets moving around. I wonder what time it is there. So Isaac Newton, he lived in 1642, 1726. His main contribution was the, the Principia. Okay, this is the book that he wrote, all right? He wrote it in Latin because that was the, the language of the time. And uh, he discovered the law of universal gravitation. This is, this is very important. So I'm going to probably leave it for next class. All right, we, we don't have uh, much time now. So I'm going to leave this for next class. We are going to discuss the law of gravitation and dis discuss the motion of, of planets with that. The only thing that I wanted to point out further is that here in the modules, in today's lesson, so if you go here to lesson 7, Newton and Kepler, the motion of the planets, there's a couple of videos that I found very, very interesting. So this one explains again, it's a review of the, the, the planetary motions. This video is actually really interesting. It's just about nine minutes long, but this professor is uh, explaining to other teachers, okay, other science teachers, how to uh, exemplify gravitational attraction, okay, and it's in a, in a very, very cool way. So I invite you to, to look at that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Deborah. I'm glad that you ask a lot of questions. You are always welcome to ask lots of questions. And I think that your questions actually added a lot to our conversation today. Okay, so... Uh, I have a couple of questions. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, do you have another question, Nathan? Yeah. For the due dates, mm -hmm. is it 10.59 our time or 10.59 Utah time? It would be Utah time, okay, but I, I don't, I wouldn't worry too much about, about that. You just turn in the homework when you feel that you have finished it and it's, it's done correctly, okay? Well, my next question, mm -hmm. is it true that we only have to do 11 lessons to pass the class? That is correct, that is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Is that for every class? That, that is actually, I, I believe that is the same for uh, each class. So, in fact, um, my, my uh, understanding is that each class has different units, okay? And, and if you complete assignments for each unit, okay, you would end up with about 11 assignments, all right, between the quizzes and the and the assignments, and then that would give you the the credit for the for for the class. Okay. Now, if I were you and had the curiosity and the inclination, I would actually try to do more of the assignments. All right. There's nothing is going nothing bad is going to happen if you do more of the assignments, <laughs> okay? But as far as they require, you are correct. It's just 11, and that is the same for all the classes. Mm -hmm. All right. In this class, for today's lesson, I have two, uh, two uh, assignments proposed. One is this activity, find out the period and mean radius from the sun for three planets and verify Kepler's third law of motion. So write a report showing your research, findings and results. Okay, so that would be one. 
The other one is write a talk describing how the things you have learned so far in class describe the order of God in the universe. Okay? So, if we go to, to one of the planets, for example, here, let me stop that. Whoa, we have gone a couple of three centuries already. But let's see if I go here, like to Venus, and go in this program. But you can find this information also in, in, in some other programs and websites. So, here we have the average distance of Venus in miles and kilometers. So you would grab the average distance. That would be the uh, semi-major axis. Okay. And then you have the, pa, 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 the length of year. This is how many days. Okay. And so you would square, the square of the period, divide that by the cube of the distance. And that is going to give you one number. If you do that for another planet, okay, so you go and find another planet. So let's say we go now to Mercury and find that information for Mercury. All right, so now here we have the distance, all right, and the length of year. So we also square that and we cube this and divide one by the other. See if you come up with the same number, okay? Is the pro are these really proportional? Okay, so that is what the assignment is when it says to... Uh, verify, you know, the third law of, of motion, okay? And you can write a report on, on that. Does that make sense? Hmm? Yeah, okay, excellent. So the period goes up, the period, the period, the square of the period is in the numerator, all right? Let me go back here and see. So let me write this with a pen. Okay. So the square of the period, the period square, is divided the uh, average distance. Okay. So the distance, let's put B for distance, and the distance is cube. Okay. All right. So if you do the period, for example, of Venus, and you divide that by the distance cube of Venus, that should be equal to, if you do the period square of Mercury, divided the distance cube of Mercury. And it would be the same if you do the same thing for, let's say, Jupiter, you know, or Saturn, Okay, or any any of the other ones. Okay. Does that make sense? Is that is that okay? So that is the the the, the idea for this assignment. So um, let's uh, finish with a prayer. Thank you very much for for joining us. I apologize for having gone a little longer today, but um, uh, let's say a prayer. Okay, okay. Yeah, you can go. If you have to go, you can go. I'm going to pray this time, all right? And then we'll, we'll finish the, the class. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank the Father for this uh, beautiful time and the opportunity that we have had to see so many things of the solar system and understand more of the order of the universe that thou hast created and why thou hast made such a beautiful and, and predictable and an awesome place for us to live and uh, please help us that we may increase in our understanding we are grateful for all these things Bless the students that they may be able to complete the assignments well and grow in their understanding of Thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you.
Thank you very, very much. And we'll see you next Wednesday. So remember, tomorrow we don't have a class. Okay? All right. So let me stop the recording.